Okay, we weren't supposed to have sun today, so perhaps uh, the, the weather gods are smiling on us. <laughs> well, that would be nice for a change. Um, tonight is dinner at Alio's, and, I, and I'm sorry for the confusion on Monday. Um, Rosa got it mixed up, and it was free on Monday, but tonight it's seven dollars. So um, hopefully all is going well. I, you know, if you need anything, please let me know, and we're going to get started with Pat. Okay. Thank okay. you. I want to thank uh, Liz and Rick for having me here. Uh, this really is an honor. If you ever get a chance to, to do something like this, I really recommend the, that you do it. Anything you can do to help out with, uh, with the rendezvous is a great thing. And anything you can do to help other people um, is, uh, is a good thing. And I hope that today you're going to be able to go away with at least some idea or some tool or some technique uh, because it's important that, that we you know, we keep growing. Um, my background, I am a 16-year newbie. I, I, and I, I really am serious about that. I go around the lot and I keep seeing stuff and it's like, wow, that is fantastic. And it's been so much fun over the years at the rendezvous to see carvers that you knew when they first started to see how they're, how they're growing. Uh, it's just been, it's been a marvelous thing to do. And, uh, there's so many new people at the, at the rendezvous this year. I just think that's really cool. Uh, about, about 10 years ago, it was estimated that there were only like 1,500 carvers in, in the world, chainsaw carvers. And at that time, I knew almost 1,000 of them. I had either seen them, talked to them, or shook their hand or whatever. And now, uh, that number has to be 10 times that. And the art is really growing uh, along with it. Uh, more about my background. Uh, I put in 30 years as a school teacher. Uh, taught American history. Uh, had an extensive coaching background. So if I yell at you to shut up, you know, <laughs> understand that. Uh, I had no, I had no art classes, and that was one of the things that, of my education, that I, it really bothered me. And I grew up in really a different era of education than it is today. Uh, my brother, my older brother was just, he was just a major pain in the ass. And I mean, he, he drove the teachers crazy. And um, he was four years older than me. And so I went into art class the first day uh, uh, in junior high. And she was going down through the, through the wall and she came to Hobart. And she, was, she went just like that. And she said, you, out in the hall. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I had, I was just sitting in a chair. So I got up and went out to the hall, and she says, "Go down to the principal's office." And then she followed me down, and they, they went into the office for about five minutes. She came back out, and the principal said, "Hey, you're going to study hall." I mean, and I mean, they could just do that stuff. So I missed out on all the wonderful stuff of art that I would have really liked to have uh, uh, liked to have had, but but didn't. Um, I didn't touch a chainsaw until I was 46 years old. I never cut firewood. I, I just, uh, I'm afraid of tools to begin with, and a chainsaw was like the last thing on my agenda to ever grab. And um, uh, I kind of got into carving because, so, you know, somebody asked me to carve something that was a heck of a lot bigger than what I thought it was. I mean, I was a hand carver. And, and so I got an old uh, electric. 14-inch uh, uh, Craftsman chainsaw through my father-in-law. I had sat in his garage for 10 years. Uh, the chain had never been changed, and I didn't know they had to be changed. And, uh, <laughs> and I started out on a piece of elm, and uh, it took it took me it took me two weeks. But <clears throat> that was so amazingly fast compared to using a mallet and chisel. I mean, I was, I was automatically hooked that I wanted to do more of this. And then when people saw, oh, you did that with a chainsaw? You know, it was awful. But, you know, they, they went and said, well, yeah, and, and they were really excited about it. And that actually started my, my chainsaw career, just the, the word of mouth. Um, I became interested in carving itself when I was six years old. Um, there, was, there was an old movie that was made in the 50s called Moby Dick with uh, Greg Newpack, and there's one scene, and and I've gone back and checked it now that you can get it, uh, you know, rent it, and the scene is only like 
I think five seconds long. And somebody on the ship is, is going to die and uh, they have requested that a certain thing is done for their, for their coffin. And the ship carpenter is making a coffin and he has, he has a mountain chisel and he is making um, the wheat life symbol on it. And I saw that and was like, I want to do that. I mean, I was just I want to do that, and um, and of course I wasn't able to for a long time. Uh, you know, I, I did get a jackknife and you know cut myself many times, and you know just because that's how how you learn, I guess. Uh, I actually, started out with soap because I had a, a two by four. It was made out of yellow pine or something. And you couldn't you couldn't cut that with a with a laser. I mean, it was really hard. But I did start carving soap, and that. And that started my my love of carving, and um, everybody's stuck in their life life rules. You know, I mean, you, if you're working another job, you'd love to carve more, but you don't have the time. And uh, hand carving was slow. And I would I would carve. I would try to carve one thing every year. I try to get one thing carved in the summer. And I had done that for years and years and years. And then I got that call from the guy that wanted a Mickey Mouse for his wife and I said yes before I knew what it was what was going on because I was a relief carver, flat plane. And um, I said yes and he told me, well I want it five feet tall and the round is like ah. you know and, and that's that's where I where I took off for the uh, electric chainsaw. Um, again my goals here is that I want you to learn something today and I'll I'll stop BSing in a while but I can't stop yet. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's important that we try to keep growing. Uh, I know as a coach, there was always a saying, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. You're never going to stay the same. Uh, so if you want to get better, you have to find things that you're interested in and be willing to go out in two degree weather and carp. Or if you live in the hot climate, you got to go out when it's 100, and you got to carve. You've got to do something five or six days a week if you want to if you want to get better. And, um, and I'll tell you what: if you're a beginning carver, just keep carving. Yes. I'm me. Oh, okay, great, <laughs> great. If you're a beginner carver, don't don't get discouraged. Just keep going. Uh, Liz will understand what I'm talking about here. There was an old carver in New York, and I guess I can mention his name, Hal McIntosh. And if you are a beginning carver, get both volumes of Hal's book, because they are wonderful for a beginning carver on the things you need to do, the tools you need, techniques, and, uh, and it's a great book. But Hal, Hal was a horse's ass. <laughs> I mean, he was, he, he was, he was, it was difficult, and uh, you know, here I am. I'm a beginning carver. I have no idea what I'm doing, and I and I heard about um, they had a, up in Tupper Lake. They had a carving competition. I said, Hey, what the heck? I might as well go. I've got the time, so um, I got a hold of them and I actually talked to his girlfriend, and she said, Yeah, come on up. We'll register you. Well, I have no idea what it's about. That is 100% chainsaw. And you know, and I was I was still you know a little bit chainsaw and a hand chisel and then use a sander and the grinder and I didn't know what I was doing so I was doing all these things out of order and I show up there and uh, I'm about 350 feet away from a power source and I didn't have a generator I didn't know any of this kind of stuff so I'm pulling I'm pulling the I'm pulling my stuff out of out of the truck. And here's the first three things that he said to me. Well, I can't tell you exactly what he said. But I pulled out an electric chainsaw, and he said, what the bleep is that? <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I didn't know what to say. I, I didn't know anything about this guy, a total stranger. And then I pulled out a template that I had made. Oh. <laughs> you can't use those. And, and he said, Jesus, blank, put that, that blank, out the truck. <laughs> and, and then he looked at me and said, why don't you just get, 
out of here. <laughs> Two of the first three things he said to me. Okay. Now, a lot of people, beginning carvers, that might end them right there. But I've been yelled at by experts in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I've driven 556 miles and I wasn't going to stay, I wasn't going to leave. I was, I was there. And it was a tough weekend. I, I can remember uh, it was, uh, I think it was two days of carving, 12 hours a day. And I had never seen a log this big. I mean, we don't get them like this anymore. It, it, this thing was this wide and was 10 feet tall. And I was like, wow, man. And, and I, I was just totally overwhelmed. I can remember I, I went back to my hotel after the first day because I was carving maybe two hours a week, you know. And I went back to the hotel and I, I made a bath and I had to yell for my wife because my arms fell down in the water and I was starting to drown. I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't get my arms up, you know? So I, it was just, it really kicked my butt. But you know what? I learned so much. That was a quantum leap in my development as a carver. I couldn't carve for crap and still some days I'm still shaky on it. But, I, but that, I learned, okay, the tools you have to have, you know, how you have to approach things, uh, you know, just techniques that I would never learned on my own. You had to get out and uh, out and, and face this. And what would it be like if you went to the gym and in walks LeBron James and you guys are just, you know, shooting fall shots together? That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> from here to Robbie was set up Gary Patterson, four-time world champion. Fantastic carver. He had the biggest log there. They, they gave it to him. And I mean, this thing was, oh, was just gigantic. And he pulls out his scaffold and says, oh, that's how you get to the top of this. <laughs> and, 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 I'm, and I never knew you were supposed to you know, bark logs and stuff. I still don't do it all the time. And, and, uh, and I'm trying to get some of this off because that's what everybody else is doing. And, <laughs> I look, I've been fighting this thing, trying to get the bark off, and I look, and up in the top of this, in 28 minutes, Gary had a full standing wolf at the top of this. And I hadn't even started a saw yet. I'm like, oh man, what have I got myself into? You know? And, um, and he made a magnificent car. It, it had wolves on it, it had eagles on it, it had, had an uh, uh, Indian, Indian maiden, and it had writing on it and everything. And, and I, I was really intimidated, but I did walk over and, and, uh, and I said, geez, this is fantastic. And he says, no, nah, this is actually crap right here. And he had, he had, a, he had a bear head, and he just cut it off. And he hit the ground and he said, you want it, you can have it. <laughs> I still have that in my home. <laughs> That's that one of the few carvings that, that I actually have in my house. And, and I mean, he was so good. I said, how do you do something like this? And he said, first off, if you want to carve this whole composite, you have to know how to carve a wolf to start with. And you have to know how to carve an eagle. And you have to know how to carve an Indian, all separately, and then be able to put it together. And I said, where did you get the idea? And he was eating a hot dog. And he had a napkin, had mustard all over it. And he flipped it over and he pulled out a pen. And he, just, he drew, I mean, in like 50 seconds, he drew, uh, he drew a whole composite carving. He said, here, this is how you do it. You've got to have a plan in your head before you start. So, um, you know, that was, that was an intimidating weekend. And I did learn a lot, but I came, I came away from it. And I was actually having second thoughts about, you know what, this might not be what I want to do. And, um, and then I heard about the rendezvous. I heard about it very late. And I called Liz on the phone because I said, said to myself, I was never going to be in a situation again where I bring the wrong stuff and get yelled at. So I, I'm talking to Liz on the phone and I said, um, uh, Tim, uh, is it, can, what kind of tools can you use? Can I bring a sander? And can I bring a die grinder? And she said, my husband is an artist. And he uses 
everything to make his carving. And if you have to pull out grandpa's dentures to do it, that's fine. <laughs> and, and it's like, wow, what a nice lady. And, and I was at the first rendezvous. And um, I showed up, and again, I didn't know, I, I, I no longer had the electric saw. I, I, I had a couple of saws now. And I showed up, and there were 32 carvers. And my eyes got this big. I didn't know there were that many carvers in the world, seriously. And it was like, man, maybe I'll get back in my truck and go home. But it was like, well, it was a long drive. I'll stay. Uh, Liz, I was telling about that conversation I had with you at the first rendezvous, where I called you ahead of time to see what kind of tools I could bring. And, and, uh, and you were great encouragement. I tell you, the rendezvous without it, I know I wouldn't have continued carving. It was a wonderful thing for me. Yeah. And, and I realized at that, at that point, at, at the rendezvous, that this was really what I wanted to do with my life. I still have the same coat, by the way. Yeah. I just can't fit in it. <laughs> you know, so I realized that the rendezvous was, was it was the spirit of the kind of stuff that I want to do. And it was the perfect place for me to be. And, and I couldn't get enough of it. Unfortunately, the Olympic Games have changed. When I, when I was a kid, I grew up, I watched every minute of the Olympics that I could get. I just loved it. I loved the spirit of the Olympics, where it's not so important to win as it is to participate. And um, <coughs> we've lost that. In the last Olympic Games, I think I watched four minutes of it. Because before they were done, I mean, they just crossed the finish line. You were interviewing this guy. He says, yeah, this will do a lot for my brand. I, 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 this will really get me a lot more money. Hmm. And the whole deal, to me, the Olymp this is the Olympics. We have people from all over the world. We have people from all over the country. We have every background you can imagine. We have people that are high school dropouts. We have people that are PhDs and everything in between. And um, I, I know for a lot of you young guys and gals, do not, do not be uh, shy of going up and talking to carvers because you're going to find out they're going to help you. If you've got a question, I'd say 99% of the people on the lot are going to be open to, to helping you and giving you advice if you ask for it. And uh, <clears throat> to me, that's the Olympic spirit. We've lost that in a lot of places, and we need to get that back. And thank God for things like the rendezvous. Amen. This, <clears throat> this is like this. <clears throat> Carving and learning how to carve is like learning how to do anything, actually. A, the constant is that everybody can learn. The variable is time. I mean, I, I had kids in school that they were smarter than me. I mean, you could throw any concept at them and they had it right now. And I had some kids that were pretty slow. But if you kept working, and they kept working, they always improved. And, and that's, that's the thing for us. Uh, that we should try to we should try to uh, grow, and um, what bothers me a lot of times is somebody goes out and they're trying to do something new, and they do it one time, and they try it and it doesn't come out exactly the way they want, and they, you know it's oh I'm not going to do that I can't learn that. <laughs> well that's wrong. You can learn it if you if you keep going at it. I mean don't quit if your first attempt at something is not a Michelangelo. I mean, the wheel has to keep turning, and, and you keep growing. So um, that, give yourself the time. Um, and really, when I started, I, uh, one of the things that really appealed to me about carving was there were not a lot of rules you know, as to how you approach to do a bear. If we have 100 people and everybody has to do a bear, we'd probably have about 75 different techniques to start it. You know, so it, that really appealed to me that you can do what you want to do and learn it the way you want and develop your techniques. And that's the neat thing about going around a lot right now. I learn, I, I learn stuff watching people right now. 
and, and, and we all will. And any approach was okay. And that, that appealed to me that we were free to kind of develop our own style and, and do what we want. I mean, if you have something that's working for you, stay with it. And if you can learn something else, somebody else's <laughs> technique, then you, you jump forward and do that. Um, carving, when you break it down to its simplest terms, is 50% great concept, a great plan. I mean, Gary Patterson wasn't just going up there and sawing something. He had it written on paper. He knew where he wanted to go. Now, he could change stuff, but he had an idea uh, of how he was going to go at it. So 50% of any carving is that. You can have the best tools in the world. You can be really talented. And if you're making something stupid, you know, it's just not going to work for you. 40% um, is the correct tools and sharp tools. And then 10% is talent. And this is, where, this is where they vary. Because you come in and we, got, we have people that have art school backgrounds. And man, they're making stuff really neat in a very short time. And you have some people that weren't even allowed to take art, and you know, you got a lot of catch up. But that last 10% is very important. But uh, again, you can, you can go <coughs> and, and, and you can learn it. You just uh, have to keep at it. You have to learn the, the fundamentals of things. Uh, you know, Michelangelo, the, you all know the story. Somebody said, well, how did you create David? And he said, oh, I took a block of marble and I knocked away everything that wasn't him. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not true. Uh, he's not going to take a 10-ton piece of marble that, <coughs> that today would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and start chipping away with it with absolutely no idea what he's going to do. He made models. He used calipers to make sure that you know, when he went from this size to 10 feet tall, that everything was exactly the way, the way he wanted it. I mean, he didn't wing it. He, there, there, there was a plan, and he just, he just knew how to do this. And uh, I think it's important to have a plan with anything. Um, and I'm usually a planner. I don't always plan right, but I, I usually am a planner. But uh, my sidekick, uh, Lumberjack, some of you probably notice he's not here. His, his wife is getting operated on, so uh, uh, he's home playing the nurse. He talks me out of good things. Okay, <laughs> we're 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 on a, we're, we're we're going to a show, several hundred miles away, and I'm starting to run low on gas. And as soon as I start to run low on gas, I want to stop. He says, "No, keep going, keep going. We got enough gas. We'll get there." You know, so I listen to him. We run out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really I'm I'm ticked off. And he says, "Don't worry, don't worry." And Lumberjack is friend to the Indian and all animals, you know. He's always telling me this crap. And he, he reaches back in his bag and he pulled out a jar of beads. And I said, what the hell are you doing with that? And he says, just wait. And he took the top off. His bees are flying everywhere. And the queen bee landed on the brim of his hat. And uh, I said, I gotta get out of here. The queen bee went and said, don't have to be afraid. Lumberjack's our friend. Stop your truck, which is always stopped. Go on out, take the gas cap off. I did. Queen bee whistled, all the bees went out, they flew into the gas tank, and all of a sudden the needle starts going up. <laughs> and the tank is filled. And I said to the queen bee, How'd that happen? How'd you do that? And she said, B P. <laughs> you, you, you've got to, you know, you've got to you know, make your plans and know, know where you're going to go with stuff. And, uh, and it's important to take the time to think through what you want to do. Okay, if something's difficult, don't stop trying. I mean, that, that's the worst thing you can do. 95% of the people in the world that fail at something don't fail because the boss comes up and says, you suck so bad, you can't do this anymore. We cut ourselves out from the herd before that. We go and say, you know, we, we put these blinders and we say, oh, I can't do that. This guy's so much better than I. This lady can do this. You know, I, I got to quit. We quit on ourselves. 
So the big thing is don't quit on yourself. Get out there, keep trying, and if it's a difficult technique, just keep working at it. Don't be afraid to lose. <clears throat> there is no loss. Um, Ed, can you bring up the, the Chip Chat magazine? Just, uh, you just have to keep hammering away at stuff. Uh, this is last month's Chip Chats. That's, that's the bearer that they had. That's what they chose to put on the front cover. Now, I am not knocking that carver uh, because the day he carved that, that's the very best thing that he could do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I say kudos to him. Now, I do have exception with the magazine and the carving club that sent that picture in because I can go out and find you about 150 bears around this lot that are done better with a, with a newer concept. <clears throat> But I hope that this gentleman, I hope this is a perk to him to keep improving. But I'm telling you right now, five years from now, if he sees a copy of this magazine, if he keeps carving, he's gonna go like this, you know. But the thing is, you just hang in there and you, you don't stop. Don't be afraid to lose, just keep carving because they'll get better if you're trying to make them better. Um, if you're a competition carver, Big hint, and I didn't know this. I mean, this is, I had to learn this by trial and error. Competition carvers that do really well, they're usually carving that carving at home two or three times before they go to the competition. And they'll probably do them on smaller scale. So they can do them quickly, but they go there and they know, they know the cuts that they want to make. They've worked at this, they train themselves to do it. And, um, and I didn't realize that. Uh, I imagine everybody in the room knows Denny Beach. He's one of the, one of the great carvers. And uh, Don Winter is, uh, is a good friend of mine, and he's very uh, much into the carving uh, scene. He runs the Addison Show. He's an older gentleman now, so he doesn't carve much because it's, it's tough for him. But um, Denny stops at his place quite often when Denny's traveling around the country. And um, I went into, uh, into Don's uh, shop, and I saw this cool carving of, you know, of like five monkeys climb, climbing up a tree and it had all been like, you know, tended in together. And I said, hey, that's Denny. He won, he won the Schnecksville show with that. And Don said, he didn't win with that. That was the third one that he practiced. Mm -hmm. So when he went to the show, he won because he knew exactly what he was going to do. I mean, everybody had a log this size. He ends up with a carving that's 10 feet tall. Talk about impressive, yes, but he didn't just pull it out of his back pocket. Uh, he he had he had worked on on that, uh, so he knew what he was doing. Uh, finding a carving niche, I think this is important too. Uh, find what you like to carve, what you love to carve, and keep working at it. Uh, for me, it's it's faces, it's it's um, it's Indians, it's the human form, and <laughs> believe me, there's stuff that. You know, I, I am so intimidated by it still. Uh, it's incredible, but it's a great learning thing. Find your niche. I mean, I came to places like the Rendezvous, and I probably took about two or 300 pictures to start with. And I go home and you know, I say, somebody's making bears and they're cool bears, and they saw a bunch of them, so, hey, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make this bear. You know, and I make the first one, it's not very good. Make the second one, I'm getting tired of doing it. Or I go and I see somebody making turtles, so now I'm going to be the great turtle maker. You know, or it just wasn't working out for me. And I had to sit down and, and kind of kind of find what was going to work for me, because I was chasing the Holy Grail. I, you know, I just didn't know which way I wanted to go with it. And um, uh, Lynn Randall, who is a fantastic carver, Lynn is, is really a great carver. And if you see his bears, that's his signature. You know he, ma he made those. He has a has a wonderful style, and I was talking to him one time. And he said, Lynn, I just love your bears. I, they look so easy. And they look so great. And, and he went and said, "They're not. Everyone is a struggle." Now this is one of the better carvers in the, in the whole country. He says, "Everyone is a struggle for me to make this." And I said, "Ah, oh, I can't believe that." And he says, "Yes." And then he told me the thing that was really important. He said. Sit down and figure out what you really want to carve. And carve nothing but that until you know until you 
uh, you know, have it down. And that took me about three weeks to sit down and decide, what do I really like to carve? What am I really interested in? And it wasn't bears. You know, I, I knew that I could carve bears for the rest of my life, and I'd never carve one as, as inventive or as pretty or as beautiful as, as some of these other guys. I, I could never be there. But I found my niche uh, really kind of through American history that I taught for years. Um, I was really interested in Indians, fascinated by them. And so I said, that's what I'm going to carve. It cost me a ton of money because I quit making bears. If you've got to make your gas money, make bears. The worst bear in the lot is going to sell. <laughs> that, that, you know, you know. <laughs> I know that man sold that bear. <laughs> he probably sold it for a lot of money since it went on the front, the front of that magazine. Pat, okay. you know, Ed's sitting back there, you know. Oh my God. <laughs> the guy's going to come over and kick my butt right in front of me. <laughs> but no, if you're sitting back there, you know, believe me, I'm not knocking your work. <laughs> but, um, you know, Lynn, Lynn said, find, find what you're interested in. And for me, it, it was Indians. And that made, that made a huge, huge difference. But it cost me money because I had to stop making other things. And any time I had free time, it had to be an Indian. Every show I went to, I just said, it doesn't matter what kind of wood I get, what kind of log I get, where I'm at, I'm going to try to make an Indian. And, uh, you know, I've made countless ones now. I couldn't tell you how many I've made. And I'm still not right where I want to be with it. But, um, you know, you got to find your niche. Now, for some of us, that niche may be, um, it may be carving small things. It may be carving intermediate things, you know, freestanding. Uh, some are tree jobs. Some people do f just fairs uh, or a combination of everything. You know, they're traveling all the time. Some people hardly ever leave, leave their shop. Uh, but you got to find your niche where you're comfortable at and where you can make your money. And for me, it, it was doing the, it was doing, uh, you know, the human form. I decided also to grab that, you know, and run with it because a lot of people were afraid to do it. I mean, it was, it was kind of intimidating because I can make a bear. You know, I can kind of make a bear. And it's not very realistic, but it can be pleasing to look at. I have never seen a bear. I've never seen a live bear. I hope I never do. <laughs> you know, so I, I, you know, if if my snout is a little wrong or something like that, it, it, it's passable. And we don't see them up close and personal either. But everybody sees faces. Well, when I was a teacher, I didn't see faces. I saw a lot of heads. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And you may not be able to, as, as a viewer of, of human form, you might not be able to say what should be changed, but you do know if it's wrong. And uh, so it, it, it takes a lot, of, a lot of work to try to get them uh, the way you want. And for me, the niche was doing Indians and when we do tree jobs, trying to talk them into some, uh, some human form. Now, um, I've teamed up with Lumberjack and we do, oh man, we do a, a lot of tree jobs. And it works out great because I'm pretty good at blocking out. And he's really, he's really good at, at animals. And I'm good at the, you're better at the, at the Indian. So we can put the collage poles together and, and they come out pretty good. And that, that's kind of a, a niche that we f fell into. Uh, just a, a little bit about tree carving. You almost invariably have to be on a scaffold. Unless you can stand, jump eight feet, make a quick cut, and, you know, you can't do that. So you got got to be on a scaffold, and that can be dangerous. So you have to try to be safe with that. Um, but you can't just carve the carving and then get down because it will not look good. Could you go to the, uh, the shadow picture, with Lincoln? Um, it's very important that you get down about every 20 minutes and look at what you're carving because when I'm carving it. And I'm right here at face level. Yeah, that all looked good. But when it's up in the air, and I'm looking at it, it'll be completely different. I'd like to just show you this. You can't really see it too well from the pictures. But this is the Lincoln Memorial. And this is the way it's supposed to be lit from the lights above down. 
one day they screwed up and they had the President of the United States and the Vice President and their wives. And they had the, they had the uh, shadowing going from the bottom up. And uh, it, co it completely makes it look different. It's a startled look. <laughs> and if, I wish you could see a good picture of this one that's clear, because Lincoln's like, you know. <laughs> so you have to, if you're going to treat jobs, uh, and especially with human forms, you're going to have to get down and take a look at them. And another little tip on that is, you know, the, the regular size human face from here to here is about nine inches and about six inches wide. Uh, if you're going to make a carving that is 78 or more feet in the air, it is important that you take your face and make it at least one size bigger. Because when you're standing on the ground, the face will look too small for the rest of the body. And uh, if you would, you know, if you see David, that, that, that sucker is 10 feet tall. And that is a principle that he, that he used. And I'm sure that Richard knows, knows about that because he does, a, Richard Hamlin does a lot of classical carvings. And, uh, you know, the face is actually, head is actually a little bit big for the rest of the body, but because it's up in the air like that, then it comes out and it, it looks really uh, the way it should. Um, so your focus. Develop your focus, what you want to carve, find out what it is, and work hard at it. You know, and it doesn't matter what it is. Todd carves chickens. Now that's not a conventional thing that you would carve. I mean, everybody starts with a bear. But he carves so many and carves them so well, they're not sitting around. People are buying them. And he, you know, I'm sure he recognized, you know, he's got a niche there because a lot of ladies collect chickens. A lot of people collect pigs. A lot of people collect uh, ducks or whatever, you know. Like, you know so find your niche and what's going to work for you. Um, and for me, it was all difficult. The focus was difficult because my knowledge was a mile wide and inch deep. You know, I mean, I knew a little bit about a whole bunch of stuff, but not very much about anything. And I think, you know, you want to try to get, get that so uh, uh, you're right where you should be. Okay, um, speed. Speed with carving. Forget it. Throw it out. Doesn't matter. There's a bunch of baloney. You don't get fast by hurrying. You get hurt by hurrying. You make crappy stuff by hurrying. You know, and when it's all done, people are going to say, gee, that was a nice carving. You're never going to say, boy, you made that in 15 minutes. And the carving will always be there. So, so you know, slow down. Um, speed does not come from rushing. It comes from repetition. And I gotta tell you the Walt Smith story. Walt Smith, old time carver from Pennsylvania. He's 79 now, he's still carving. <clears throat> you look at him and say he can't do anything. <laughs> I was in line behind him a few years ago and he was signing in. And he was shaking holding the pen, just like that. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, man, this guy can't saw, he's gonna kill himself. <laughs> well, he gets the saw started and it's, this is all smooth. He can make a six-foot Indian. They're always the same. He makes a six-foot cigar store Indian, and he can carve it in 90 minutes. And it's really cool. I mean, it, 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 is, it is really cool. And what he'll do, he'll go to a show, get a 10-foot log. Carve a six-foot Indian, carve a four-foot perch needle. And it's never, he never rushes. There's, there's not, uh, not anything where he's cut up. I mean, it just all flows. It is magic to watch this man carve. And I will, you know, I have become friends with, with uh, well, because we're both interested in the same thing. And so, well, how many of these have you made in your life? And he goes, uh, one, no, maybe about two, about 2,000. He started carving when he was in his mid-30s. So he's carved a long time. But, but let's think about that for a second. 2,006 foot Indians. It's 1,200 feet. That's two, if you put them end to end, 
That's two and a quarter miles long. <laughs> That's nine times around the high school track. <laughs> <laughs> it's eight times, you could have eight Empire State Buildings and still have 61 Indians left over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you know, and, and he, you know, it, it's incredible, but it is repetition. You do, you know, you go out and see Denny Beach or Brian Ruth or the Bonnies or whoever, you know, carving people have been into it over a long time, and they don't look like they're Russian. They just, they just know what the next cut is, and they make it, and it's all smooth, and it's so cool to watch. Uh, Denny Beach probably has had more to do with people carving than anybody in the country, because it just makes it look so easy. You know, and then, oh, that's easy, I'll be able to do that, and then you get the saw, and like, oh man, what am I doing? You know, and it becomes a lot, a lot more difficult. Okay, um, could you go to the first face formula here? <coughs> okay, um, no, I did not invent anything. Okay, nothing. All of this is taken from great carving books, and um, uh, so I have to say that to begin with. But there is a formula, just a, a Cheryl. Campbell was talking about the other day. There's a formula for, for making these kind of things. Now you can get away with it on a lot of your animals, but you can't, you can't get away from a formula and make a pleasing human face. They just don't come out right. Um, it's a one-third situation. You, and you're your own model. Take your fingers, put it on your hairline, go to the bridge of your nose or your, your brow. Now don't change the fingers, bring them out, and put it back here, down the bottom of your nose. And then go from the bottom of your nose to your chin. It's one third. And that, that just, that stays almost for everybody. Then, then what you do, then, then what you do is your eyes fall in the middle of your head. And this is a big beginner mistake, because people put their eyes up here, okay? You go from the top of your bald head, down to your chin, find out where the half line is, and your eyes fall right in that line, okay? But this is a, this is a good, uh, good key, and it does vary for people, but in most cases it works. Um, you find out where the middle of your eyes are, and draw a line down, and generally that's the corners of your mouth. And so uh, it's it's not something that um, that uh, changes a whole lot in people. Uh, if you ever seen a carving where people put ears in the wrong places, <laughs> I mean, it happens, and they're not symmetrical. Right here is the uh, the formula for that. You come through the bridge of the nose, right about the top of the ear, bottom of the nose, bottom of the ear. Now, does that ever vary? Oh, heck yeah, because, you know, older people are going to have bigger ears. I just, I don't know why that happens, but, you know, their ears seem to grow. Um, and, and, you know, there's those little changes, but that's generally uh, where it's going to, where it's going to fall to. Now, I don't want to turn everybody off, but for me, I use metric. Now, rather than scaring you, we're no longer going to say the word metric. We're now going to say ridgeways. Ridgeways. Okay. <laughs> And so, if a human face is about between eight and nine inches, let's say eight and a half inches, I'll go look on my ruler. I, every ruler I buy, I have standard on one side and ridgeways on the other. Okay? And I will come down and figure out, okay, eight and a half inches, that's 21 ridgeways. You know, I don't know if that's a millimeter, a centimeter, a foot a meter, I don't know. So, but, but, but <laughs> thank you, Lee. I knew you'd know that. Okay, and um, and again, the formula is that hairline to chin, whatever that is, your face is about two thirds of that. Now, I can't add, subtract, multiply, or divide that whole. But I got these, and um, when I want to want to figure out things, like let's say that this is. 21 ridgeways from here to here. I uh, put in here and I divide that, you know, into two thirds. 
and voila, that comes out to 14 root widths. And that's, that's how I figure stuff. Um, and if you want to, yeah. Stay right there. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't want to go back and forth with the camera. I don't want to stay there. I don't. <laughs> okay. I, give me a chair and I'll stay there. Sorry. Um, but it, I think it's important that you do follow the, those things. Now, if you're making caricatures, all bets are off. You know, like you're making wood spirit caricatures, it's great, yeah, huge noses, big eyes, you know, uh, you have the faces turned, that's fine. But if you're going to go for uh, for realistic, I, you know, I think you have to stay on to these rules. Um, another thing, i go to the next picture, would you? Uh, another thing that uh, that shows the kind of the relationship with the ears and the chin and everything, um, I think it's important, and don't turn me off here, I think it's important that you learn how to carve with both hands. Carve right hand and left hand. How many of us in here have a sore arm? Come on. Yeah, okay. It's over it's overuse. Now if you develop using your left hand, it'll it'll cut down a lot of that. And you say, oh, I can't do that. Well, yeah, you can. It just goes back to trying to learn a difficult technique. <laughs> I can remember when I was a kid and I was playing on a basketball team, you know, and just starting out, and the coach said, Well, you come to this side, you gotta make a left handed layup. Well, you know, I can't dribble the ball with my left hand, can't do it with my right. You know, you know, you know trying to do that, and then, you no, know, you gotta go off this foot and throw the ball up, you know, to the backboard. And, um, you know, so you can learn it because I know that a lot of people in here did play basketball. And and learn how and learn how to do that, you know, you know shoot with both hands on, on layups. Now, my coach taught me a word, a new vocabulary word. He said, "You, sir, are totally ambidextrous." That means you can use either hand. Then he finished up by saying, "You can't shoot with either hand. You can't dribble with either hand. You know, you're terrible. You know, so um, you know, learn how to do things." Um, with, with both hands and uh, and for me it was an easy transition to make because I never cut firewood. I had never used a saw for any other purpose other than carving and if we start out, here's my saw today, if we start out and you're carving with the right hand this is your foot stamps. Now if you're going to use your left hand for part of your carving, you change hands and you change your feet position. And what I would do, like, because I am right-handed, so when I'm carving one side of the carving, I'm carving with my right hand, I always start with that hand, and then you got that muscle memory, and I can just flip it over the other way. Uh, and, you know, especially like when you're blocking stuff out, and you don't have to be, you know, exactly accurate on it, put that saw in the left hand, change your foot stance, and, and, and cut. You know, I'll tell you what, when you're blocking out and using the big saws, that's where your arms get tired and, you know, stress gets in there. So, so try to do that, and especially with faces where you want to try to get um, um, symmetry, I think it's important that, uh, that we do that. Can you flip to the next picture? No, I want to. Three. <coughs> oh, yeah. Okay, uh, just quickly, if you're going to do faces, faces have ears. And you might be able to hide them and get away with, you know, if you're doing an Indian, put it into, a, into an Indian bust or old man, cover it up with hair so you don't have to do it. But sometime, you're going to have to do ears. And um, uh, I took a wood carving, hand carving class in Austria at um, you know, Geyser Marauder School. Fantastic experience. And uh, one of the first things that they did is they brought out a model. This model is 600 years old. <laughs> it's got caliper marks in it all over. And, um, and then they hand you a little block of wood and, and, and chisels. And they said, carve this. And so I'm an American. I don't mark out anything. I just look at that and I start carving away. And they come, nine, nine, nine. You know, they're all going crazy on me <laughs> because I wasn't using the calipers. So you find out what an ear looks like. This really varies. 
but it generally has a Y in it. And you got a hole. And you got a little knobby here. Get it in the right position, draw those things in, start to carve it. It'll make your ears much more realistic. And if you get them so that they're symmetrical, you know, you, you will have hit okay. Uh, could you go to the next one here? Okay, um, common mistakes. Make the eyes too close together. The noses are too long or too short. The mouth is too far removed from the eyes. The chin's too big. You know, there's a whole list of things that you can do. Now, here's my starter. I would never dream of going down the lot and mocking somebody out on something. Never. I mean, that, that's sacrilege. So I made this. I'm really proud of it. I made it in four minutes and 45 seconds. Doesn't look very good, though, does it? There's no symmetry. Nose is hanging off the face. One eye up, one eye down. Didn't make an eye, just made a hole and then, then, then another hole. That's not what an eye is. You know, and here's, if you can see, well, everybody see this, the nose is hanging off the face 100%. Your nose does not hang off your face. If you put a pencil up along your nose, like this part is actually back here behind the mouth mount and then the tip sticks out, okay? And that ain't what this is. And this is this is a totally crappy carving, but it was, you know, I copied it from one of my earlier ones. Okay? The hair, this made flats, and that's not what you want. It doesn't look realistic, it looks odd. You might not know much about faces, but you look at this one and say, that's not very good. Uh, but you can you can change it. There are other things that you can do uh, to uh, to make them better. This really odd looking thing here is the eye chart. From here to here is basically about five eyes wide. You know, we stick it. You should be able to stick an eye in between these two eyes, and that's just rule of thumb. To try to get your symmetrical. A situation for you, um, and there are all kinds of kinds of things here. I mean, you go from the outside of the eye down to the bottom of the lip, and that forms a triangle. You know, Cheryl did a great job on that yesterday. If you saw that, but the same concept here. You just have to find out where um, where it falls in at. Uh, could you go to the head proportions? Cheryl also talked about this with, with animals, but it's very <coughs> true with uh, with humans. Now, one of the great debates uh, between artists is, you know, head height of a person. And they say, okay, it's seven and a half. No, it's seven. No, it's eight. I go with eight because if I make things look a little taller, it looks a little bit better. But this weird, weird looking thing here, as you can count how many heads high this is. So you use your calculator, you figure out how big you want that face to be, and now you know how big to make the whole body lengthwise. How wide it is, how long the arms are. You can use this to find out where the where the belly button falls in. And it's a nice little nice little tool, uh, but again, I certainly did not invent this. This is something that was made a long time ago. <coughs> Could you go to the next one? Now this is a, the formula that I use, you know, for making making an Indian. This is a typical Indian. You know, the customer never says to me, "I want a carving that's 183 centimeters." They don't do that. It's I want it six feet. I want five feet. I want it ten feet. So I don't know what that is, but I get out my ruler and I find out how many feet it is, and then I look across and see how many. Ridgeways, that is. I measure my model, and I like to use calipers. It's bottom, base, top. I use my calipers, and I lay that down on the table, and I come here. How many ridgeways have I got? 
Okay. And I take that number and I divide that into the um, into the height of the actual carving. And I think I, I put it on here. Um, here's the model. My model is 17 and a half ridgeways. My carving is going to be 183. I do the math that comes out to 10.5, 10.4 10 you know, or 5. You can round that off and you'll be, you'll be pretty close. And so after I have determined that, then I can go to my model and say, okay, where's the chin at? Where's the top, the top of the head dress? And then I measure that, multiply it by my magic number, and go and find that on my carving. <laughs> and, and I don't do that for every single little thing, but I certainly do it for what I call the landmarks. Top of the head, chin is a landmark. Where the shoulders fall, I gotta have that. Where my elbows fall, or my hand, belly button, crotch. And if you can get those landmarks in where that falls at, then your carving is gonna be, uh, uh, be uh, a little closer to what, what it should be. Uh, can you go to this one? There are variations in faces. We, we, you know, we, it's marvelous when you look at faces. We're, we're all different. I mean, we got people in here, bone tight, 100% great shape. You got guys like me, you know, you got to search for a bone in there. Um, my older brother has the most amazing face now. He just retired. He's worked his whole life. He's worked hard. He's got these gigantic bags under his eyes, and there's lines under the bags, and there's big, uh, big creases in his forehead, and I mean, his face is so interesting now. He's ugly, too, but he, he, he's got, got these great, great marks in there, and when you add those things to a carving, it really gives you a, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of character. And, you know, faces change in shapes. Let's say you got to do a Buddha. Well, you might be consistent here, but you want to make the face wider because you want that round face. Let's say you're going to do somebody who's got the so-called horse face. Well, this will be the same. You'll make it a little more narrow. Uh, you know, you have to play around with, with that aspect, but uh, in, in the end, it all, all works for you pretty well. Okay. Um, let's see where I'm at here. I guess by using this system, you can avoid the WAG system. W-A-G. <laughs> Wild ass guess. <laughs> because that's what I did for a long time, and man, it, it just didn't come out. And unfortunately, because they do a lot of tree jobs, there's proof that I screwed up. <laughs> I, I drive by some places, I actually go like that. <laughs> you know, and you want to get better at it, uh, you're going to have to work and realize you're going to make a few mistakes. Okay, so we talk about transposing. <coughs> Use a lot of models. Use a lot of pictures. It's not cheating, folks. <clears throat> Jeff Samandowski is not here today. You watch Jeff Carve. He's one, he's one of the great ones. And he'll put up a 4 by 8 sheet apply. You know, just have pictures smathered all over it. And he doesn't care one little bit that you look at that and say, oh, you're cheating. He doesn't care. Because what he cares about is having a finished up wonderful carving. Thank you. So it's not cheating to use pictures and use models. I have actually seen some top-notch carvers that have gone and cut out a picture of what they're going to carve and they tape it on the head of their saw and they look at it as they go. I actually saw one guy, a real good carver, he took his smartphone Brought the pictures up and he put it over on the log. I mean, he had sawdust all over, but yeah, that's next to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I, I've seen people do all that stuff, and, um, and and I think it's really important that you're not afraid to do something like that. Okay, real quick, safety. Oh, yeah. If you lose your eyes, they don't grow back. Okay. If you screw your lungs up, they don't come back. I wear mesh glasses. And I don't want to step in on, on uh, Kevin's talk here, but um, these are fantastic. Be, 
I tried to wear a respirator for a long time, and I always end up ripping them off because I was wearing conventional safety glasses, and they fogged up on me. You know, you go out today and it's cold, you breathe, your glasses are going to fog. This is mesh, in a fog. Where can you Where, get it? What's that? Where can you get them? I got these from Bailey Catalog, the, uh, the logging supply company. But, you know, if you find a U.S. American Safety, they, they handle these too. Uh, and when you first put them on, it's a little bit like wearing sunglasses. And you say, oh man, that mesh is kind of weird. But if you wear them for five minutes and carve, they don't bother you anymore. I use this type of respirator. It has a little breathing tube here. And this is this has been great for me. I wish I'd have found this 10 years ago. I would have less breathing problems than I do today. So I start out with that. Of course, we're wearing ear protection. You, you must do that. Okay. My set of faces here, I use two saws for this. I use a 14 inch tuning on a 250 steel and I used a 10 inch carving bar on, uh, on 170 steel. So, you know, you don't have to have a gazillion saws to do, do the smaller stuff, but, but that did help me. <coughs> Other things I use, <coughs> everybody uses this. Does everybody use this though? You take that off and you're <coughs> in trouble. Now, this is a tough tool. You can get hurt with this even when you're doing what you're supposed to do. I was in an ice house, real tight quarters. You know, it was summertime, but I had to have my jacket on. I'm in, you know, sand in this ice, and somehow <coughs> I leaned, and this went into my coat. And it, it caught in my coat, and it came around, hit me in the face, and it hit me in the face again, it hit me a third time. Fourth time I fell and I pulled it out of the wall. And I, my coat is just destroyed. I, I'm lucky I didn't get cut. But I was like, holy cow, did that happen fast? I mean, really, it hit me in a, hit me in a jaw uh, four times before it got away. So then I went from the starter up here to the paddle wheel. So now, if it hits me in the face and I drop it, you know, and because it pulled around my hands, you know, it's going to stop, stop running. So I, when you look for your tools, try to look for things that are safe. Unfortunately, I haven't found any die grinders that are like that. But um, here are the two things that I use primarily when I do a face. I use the flame. Some people call it a pair. By the way, Donna Seriani has them for sale. I don't get a commission, but, you know, it's a good place you can find it. Okay? And then the other indispensable tool to me is a taper. It's also called a needle. And when I do a face, I have to have those two things. I only take it just so far with a saw. You know, step one through seven here, that's 100% chainsaw. But to finish it out and make it look a little bit better, more human, then I have, to, I, have to, I have to use this. Unless I'm doing a face that's not 12 feet tall, you know, and this wide, you know, you could do that with a saw, but you don't get that very often. And then another little <laughs> trick I found is a nylon flap wheel. And I, and I really like these. I get them at um, you know, Home Depot and Harbor Freight and places like that. And um, they polish your wood. So you have sanded. Then you put a sanding sealer on it and you polish over with this and you get a really nice smooth look. It really is good for taking all those little fuzzies off that drive us crazy. I always showed you this, showed you this, showed you this. Sometimes I use these, you know, especially when I go equal distance on ice. And I can't do anything without my trusty level. Now I have a lot of carvers give me a lot of crap about this. What are you drawing all those lines for? You're going too slow. What is this? this? Let me, you know, and like, hey, you make your rules, I'm making mine. I'm going to do it my way. Well, you can't make anything doing like that. And I said, yes, I can. And to prove it, I made this in a one-hour quick carve, had five minutes left over. And I didn't have to hurry. I don't hurry when I do a quick carve. I mean, I've, I got crap on my feet. I stop and I throw it out. Yeah, you see me do it. Yeah, I just, I don't hurry. 
and uh, uh, you can do this in an hour with practice and you'll have your lines in and it'll really uh, really help you uh, do things. I wanted to find a metal ruler today but then I decided oh, I'd be too much like the nuns you know <laughs> you see that ruler and you'd have flashbacks about it so I'm using my uh, this is my saw here. Um, I start out everything with a flat plane, with a flat plane carver. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I keep it in the log, and then you got that, no, that. I just don't do that. I do this so I can draw on it and get what I want. This is 21 ridgeways by 14 ridgeways. Okay, one third, one third, one third. Okay, this is seven ridgeways, that's 12 ridgeways, or uh, 14, that's 21 up there. So, you know, and that's about, that's very close to human size for the face. Then I go from here to here. And I start with a series. I start with a series of slicing cuts down here. One of the things you don't want to do is hurry so much that you make mistakes. A mistake is, it takes a lot of time to fix up. I actually make five passes down on each side of the face, right hand on one side, left hand on the other for symmetry. And five passes gives you an inch wide, and then you can come back here and shave that out and not hit the face box. <laughs> you see those are smooth. Okay. It's not deep enough yet, but I can deepen it as I go. And now I come up and I do a slicing cut from the brow line to about the hair line. You can change this around the angle of it a little bit, depending on what type of uh, what type of uh, face you're shooting for. And then I come in here, do the same thing, five slices through there. Well, sorry, and then I make five slices up here. And now the tricky part, I've got to come across my saw and come down and meet that and drop that little block off. And then I end up with this. I've cut these lines away. I want to put in new lines. I put in a new center line, and then these could be any distance here, here, and here, lines are equal distance on both sides. So I just take this and draw those in. I never use magic marker. This is just for the for the talk today. Magic marker is going to go into the wood and stain it. So I use a carpenter pencil and uh, uh, try to try to do things that way. Now, from this one to this one, I am going to make a shaving cut down the side, okay? This is real important. Now your face will not be flat. That baby, well, that's a flat face. Nothing was taken off of that. That's, that's a major mistake. So you take this down, okay? Redraw the lines. Now I'm going to make even more lines. I'm going to come around the side of the face. I'm going to go here and here. You know, have my lines there. And I'm going to you know, there's, a, there's a dip in your notes, right? And you have the best pattern in the world. You can take a mirror of just your hands and, and, and feel your face and see what, what you need. Um, I draw a line here and here, and that will be used uh, later on in the next step. Can you follow me as I walk down? I make a shaving cut across here trying to hit these lines like that. Okay. Then I start to round off the sides. I make a side cut here. You see these lines that I had? I have to take this and cut here and take that out on both sides. Then I take my saw and I try to deepen this See how deep this is, how deep that is? I went back and I, and I deepened that face. Now I shaved this down because the jaw of any mammal, be it a human, a bear, a gorilla, whatever, is smaller here than it is up here. You know, you go out on a lot and you see a lot of bears where they got, you know, that big jaw there. That, some lady will say, hey, that's cute, or some guy say, hey, I gotta have that for my cabin, and they'll buy it, but it's not, it's not right, because we all have that drop, okay? Then I make a cut in here, 
and make a little slice off there. I make <coughs> cuts down here, just one shave, and I redraw lines. <coughs> then I go up to my next step. I have to get in here and make these eye um, eye holes, and I don't. It's it's a technique. Now I lay it in, and I kind of wiggle the saw. I don't really cut. I come in, and I'm hitting it this way. I don't come in here and try to dish it. Okay. I come up here, take that down that way, and um, you can see it's starting to take some shape. Then I make a reference line on the nose. And I determine first, okay, does that look about right? And I draw a line from here to here. And then I'll use this line over here. So this should be equal to that. I take this back a little bit further. I deepen the face again. And don't forget the throat, neck. You know, if you thing is going to have ears, you got to have ears. It's got to have a neck. Okay? And especially when you get to the point where you're going to start doing this and turning things. I'm so fat you don't see this anymore, but you know, there's, a, there's that tendon right from back here that comes across. Bill, wake up! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, I make this slicing cut. I should have stayed out of the moonshine last night. Yeah, you should have. <laughs> You come down here on both sides of the nose, and um, you've got a piece of wood that sticks out here. You have to slice, you know, slice this back. And again, it's not a big cut. You tip your saw and just wiggle it back. And now a tough one for me. I have to come down here and make a slice cut, and then make that cut into into the face. So this is why these lines are on here because I'm coming down the side of the nose and now I know I want to turn that in like that. A little twist down. Now it will stick out and you have to come and shave that back. Okay. <coughs> this one I have a lot of trouble with. This is probably for me the hardest part uh, of doing a face with a saw. I have to get up in here and I start on this side and have to just make a little light cut like that. And I have to come back <coughs> on the other side. Ted, can you pull that to the center of the table? Yeah. Because the further you get it over to that side, we can't see it. Okay. We'll start right back from the beginning. This is a tough cut for me. But once you get that in, then you can kind of slice down here. And you're creating a mouth mound. Real important. If you don't have a mouth mound, all all game is off. You got to have that. And then the last tough mouth thing, you, get, you have to do it with finesse, and you do it just one pull. You have to go in the middle and make a little pull, and then go over the other side and make a little pull. And if you sneeze. You mess it up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, it's, it's kind of, kind of, kind of toughy. But you get, you get to this point, okay? Then number seven, you keep rounding, especially around the eyes here. You taking that that mound. You want to make this dip up here in the forehead. You want to make sure you have a mound in the face, and now you want to. Uh, re-plunge uh, with your saw here and start to create a mound. Biggest mistake people make with eyes is that they don't create mounds. The eye they make is flat. That thing's flat. You just cut right there. It's no deeper here than it is here. It should be deep here and deep here and rounded in the, in the middle. There's, there's words for that. It's concave and convex, but I'm not smart enough to remember which one it is, so I'm going to say it. Um, but you, uh, you get to that point. And here is 100% chainsaw. Uh, I've also decided, uh, next step over there, back step, 
I decided, okay, I'm going to put in a hairline there. And I didn't go real deep because I've got a face on the other side. I didn't have the wood. Now let's say that, let's say I'm carving and it comes out like that and I know it's wrong. What do I do? I take my saw and I make a flat plane I start over. Now when you're, when you're working on a tree job and it's people's yard, it's best not to make a mistake. But if you do, you've got to go and cut that away. So one of the techniques that I'm really, I'm harping all the time about this with Jack, is you don't back cut anything. If I go and establish the back of my carving and then I have to cut off a face like that, I got trouble. But if I don't back cut, I still have plenty of wood and I can go back, uh, go back and take care of that. So, you know, I establish a little hair here and a braid. And Now I come to this one and I do a light sanding. Take off any sharp things I want to take off. Sometimes I want sharp things on it, sometimes I don't. Um, and then I'll put a sanding sealer on it, let it sit for two hours, and I come back and hit it with this baby. Then I'll decide, okay, I want to do my eyes. Now I've created mounds here. This is wrong. These mounds should be way, way deeper. This, this is too flat for my liking. But you make mistakes, right? But I want to have a nice mound here. Then I create the upper eyelid. Then I start to push that mound back inside that lid. Then I create a bottom eyelid. And I have an eyeball. Are you using the bits, the burr bits? Yes, I'm I'm using this and this now. I'm sorry, I should should do that. You know, I come in here and I round these here. And then come in with this and create this eyeball and try to get this down. Major mistake. I got one right, I got one wrong in this. Your eye actually slants back into your head like this. If you have your eyeball sticking out like that, like the bottom of the eye sticks out more than the top, it'll look wrong. I can't tell you why, but it does. So you gotta get the eye angle to angle back in. And if you do that, it'll, it'll come out, I, I think, a little more pleasing for you. And um, I get this and trim around in there and all that kind of good stuff. Don't forget these two important things. When you're working on your nose, you have to have nerves and nose holes. Sometimes guys forget to put them in. And you've got to put this little baby in right here. That's, that's God's secret. When every child is born, God grabs them and tells them the secret to life. And then he goes like this. So you're born and you can't remember it. And then you, you search for that the rest of your life. But don't forget. Don't forget to put that in. Okay. Um, and uh, you may want to deepen this. Uh, mistakes that I, a uh, major mistake I have on this one. Can you get this, Jerry? Yep. Th this nose is, uh, right here, is too flat. It's not off the face enough. Now, you say to yourself, my nose is not right. Okay, stop working on the nose. Stop it. The nose is okay shape-wise, it just isn't in the right position. So to make this better, I will pull this cheek back on both sides. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you do that and, uh, and uh, then your nose will, will uh, be more prominent because this is a, a, little, a little flat right here. Okay, uh... Oh, I, I, I screwed up. I was supposed to be showing the X side. I'm sorry. Kids wouldn't let me get away with that. 
be sleeping. Spirit, Moses, Jesus, Santa Claus. By making little changes on, on this, you kind of got that with this face. Um, I started with a flat plane, just like I've started everything. Okay. One big important thing I have to remember is under the nose, and that's where the nose falls, I need to draw a couple lines so I know I'm going to have mustache and beard hanging down. Okay. So I get that, and now I go back and I make my cuts here to take that off. But I have, when I get to the nose area, I have to angle out so I'm not cutting that beard off. Okay. Now, I go to this one. And I decided no, I want to kick the beard the other way. So I brought the beard over here keep drawing my mustache in. All of the steps that we had before are basically the same. You know, I'm making a box, I'm rounding the box, I'm redrawing my, my um, uh, lines in after I cut them off, and uh, you know, it, it's very, very the same. And I got to here and said, heck, I don't want my beard that way, I want the beard the other way. It's yours to make however you want it to make. And then I went to the next step, I said, ah, I don't like that beard over here. I'm going to make it this way. Okay, so you know you can you can change things around as you go. All the concepts are still the same on how to create the face. Then you go to here and you deepen the face box, and you start to make your beard and mustache. Another major mistake that we make is this right here. Here's my hair. It's just, a, it's just a mass, and I just put lines down. If you want your carving to look funky, do it. It's it, it just, it just not the way that, that it will come out well for you. You want to create masses. Here's one, here's one, here's one, back here is one. You create masses and then submasses. And after you've got that, so it looks about the way you want it, then you come in and you put in your hair. Never put your hair in with straight lines. Just shake, shake your saw, whatever. You know, make, make, them, uh, uh, make them irregular and it will look better for you. You know, straight hair, sometimes people have straight hair, but in a carving, it, uh, it doesn't look well. Then I come over here and I did the same thing as I, as I did before. Uh, one thing is I uh, put a little more uh, deepening here on the on the cheekbone and, and tapered that down. And uh, here's something that is way wrong with this one. This is way off, but you can get away with it with a wood spirit. See where the mouth is at? Okay. One third, one third, one third. I'm too I'm too low with this. But since it's hidden in a beard, it looks okay. If he didn't, if he didn't have, well, thank you. If he didn't have uh, have a beard on, that would look that would look wrong. Unless he was doing this. <laughs> now, if you have to, you know, make the screaming man, then your chin is going to drop down because you know your mouth is opened up. So you know you have to have a little plan on doing those things before you start carving. Because once you've made certain cuts, you've committed yourself. The only thing you got left is cut it off and start again. And, and again, this nose too flat. I, 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 could have, I could have taken more material away from here and it would have made my nose pop out. You know, and this is something, I, it was hard for me to learn this. I'd look at something and say, man, that's not right. And I keep in messing with the eye. It wasn't the eye that was wrong. I, I hadn't taken this material away from the side. I didn't round that enough, or you know, I, I made my nose too flat, 
and it only appears flat because these are too pronounced. And again, if you're doing caricatures, it doesn't matter. And you get away with it. You know, because it's a whole different thing. But try to do more realistic than uh, you got to go this way. <coughs> Questions? Anybody need to get woke up? No. <laughs> Thank you. That's it.